You just mentioned terror management theory again, and I think it's time that we get there. And just as we began by fleshing out the key term of self-esteem, I think that before we get into the specifics of terror management theory, we ought to just flesh out what what terror means, how you how you really rigorously define it as a psychologist. Yeah, actually, we don't. It was a mistake to uh, <laughs> use that term. Okay, so, that's good to so, know, too. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, Robinson, these are great. I'm enjoying this because I love your questions. So we read the Becker books in the 1980s, uh, and uh, we thought the ideas were compelling. Uh, and um, and the, and the anyway, to make a long story short, we, we wrote a paper for the American psychologist where we just described Becker's ideas. We're like, hey, we read a book. We think this guy... Uh, has uh, a lot uh, uh, of value. Uh, and anyway, the paper was rejected. Uh, uh, one of the reviewers with a single sentence, I have no doubt that these ideas are, are of no interest to any psychologist alive or dead. And, and, uh, and you know, and eventually uh, we talked to the editor of the journal and he said, look, dude, uh, no one will take these ideas seriously in academic psychology unless you provide empirical evidence for them. And you guys are experimental psychologists, so why why don't you do that? And we're like, all right, crap, I guess this will give us something to do. Uh, so uh, we knew uh, uh, from an experimental point of view that our job was to take Becker's ideas in like 14 books and, and reduce it to a paragraph. That's basically... Uh, a theory is just a set of conceptual declarations that allow you to generate hypotheses that can be subsequently subjected to empirical scrutiny. So that, so we're like, all right, uh, let's do that. And so we're, so what we call terror management theory, basically we were being annoying. There was a theory at the time of self-esteem called impression management. And the argument there is that we want to have high self-esteem so that the people around us are impressed. Now, we don't disagree that that happens, but our point is that that's very superficial. So we're like, ultimately, you're not trying to manage other people's impressions. What you're really trying to manage is your own existential anxiety. And so that's where... Uh, we got the term terror management. Uh, and But it comes from a William James quote. I think he uses the word terror someplace. And then we had, you know, the munch, primal, the scream. Uh, but anyway, so terror management theory is just our haiku-like summation of Becker. It's the uniquely human awareness of death gives rise to potentially debilitating existential terror that we manage uh, by embracing cultural worldviews that give us a sense of meaning and value. Therefore, whether we're aware of it or not, uh, we are at all times fundamentally motivated to maintain a sense that life has meaning and that we have value. And finally, whenever we are challenged, our sense of meaning or value, or whenever concerns about death are aroused, we will respond defensively in ways to restore confidence in our beliefs uh, and faith that we're people of value. So that's that's kind of terror management theory in, in a nutshell. And, and we already talked about the one line of research, and that was to demonstrate that people, uh, when their self-esteem is raised, that anxiety goes down. Uh, the next line of research is what we call mortality salience. We were like, how do we prove that your beliefs and my beliefs reduce death anxiety? Well, we're like, okay, let's remind some people that they're going to die and other people, let's have them think about something uh, unpleasant but not fatal. Well, if death is, is special, uh, then you should cling more tenaciously to your culturally constructed beliefs, and we should be able to detect that by measuring your reactions to aspects of those beliefs. So sometimes we ask people to just write down, how do you feel about yourself dying? 
Other times we're a little more subtle. We do it outside the lab, but we stop some people in front of a cemetery, other people a hundred meters to either side. The coolest stuff is when we do it in the lab and people are like reading on a computer and we flash the word depth for 28 milliseconds so fast that you don't see anything. And so uh, anyway, there's now more than a thousand of these studies uh, and they show consistently that these very subtle reminders of death have potent effects uh, on attitudes and behavior. So when you're reminded uh, that you're going to die, uh, you hate and hurt uh, anybody who's different. When you're reminded that you're going to die, you become more slavishly devoted uh, to populist demagogues, be they Adolf Hitler or today's Donald Trump, Orange Hitler. It's the same phenomenon uh, when you're reminded that you're going to die. You deny that humans are animals. Uh, you piss on the planet uh, in an effort to ignore the physical environment uh, while you spend inordinate amounts of time uh, selfishly devoted to craving uh, money and stuff. Uh, and so, um, and so that's, that's another paradigm. We remind people that they're going to die uh, and it alters their attitudes and behaviors in predictable ways. And then we have one more, uh, paradigm that we call the death thought accessibility paradigm. And that's if you challenge people's beliefs, uh, or if you undermine their self esteem, uh, that makes uh, unconscious thoughts of death come more readily to mind. Right, and then there's another boatload of studies that show the relationship between all of those paradigms. And so, for example, it, 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 normally if, I, if we remind a Christian that they're going to die, uh, they love Christians more and they hate Jewish people. Right, but if we raise self-esteem first and then remind people they're going to die, they do not become more derogatory towards folks who are different, just showing that all these concepts are interrelated. Hmm. Well, everything you've just said opens up about a hundred new lines of questioning. But just the first thing, you mentioned a, a, another William James quote in there. And if I'm not mistaken, the worm at the core, the title of your book comes from another one of his sayings. So he's just a, a gift that really keeps on giving. But maybe sticking again, just briefly before we get more deeply into the research to a more meta conceptual issue, how quite roughly do you manage to study death awareness and terror management in a laboratory setting when since due since due to ethical considerations you can't just go around frightening people there has to be like a limit to what you can do uh how do you skirt these limits and make it work there's uh, actually that's a fine point what's makes this um it's very counterintuitive robinson it's a great question when we um ask people to write down what they think about dying, they don't report any anxiety, nor do they become more physiologically aroused. Ditto when they're standing in front of a funeral parlor, uh, nor do people report any emotional distress when we flash the word death for 28 milliseconds. And so, when we go to the uh, IRB, the Institutional Review Board, and we say we're going to remind some people about death, and often at, in, when we're working in schools, we use as a control condition, we ask people to think about their next exam. Uh, and every time we do this, the, the IRB comes back and they're like, you can't ask people to think about it, uh, themselves dying because that could be catastrophically traumatic. But there's now over a thousand studies with literally tens of thousands of participants and no one has yet uh, had any negative reactions 
to the death reminders that we use in these experiments as long as we screen for depression and suicidal ideation, if that makes sense. So as long as we pre-screen. All right, but the funny part is that if you want to make a college student really anxious and physiologically unsettled, ask them to think about an exam. Yeah. So our, our and because we have demonstrated and published uh, that for a college student, it is more harrowing to think about a test than to die. And that's what usually gets us to be able to do these studies. It's on empirical grounds. Uh, if we were really more brutal uh, and, you know, we're asking people to lay in a coffin or something, then it would be ethically problematic. 